Hezbollah poised to strike Israel independent of Iran, sources say. Hezbollah, the Lebanon-based militant group, appears to be preparing to strike Israel independently of Iran, according to sources familiar with intelligence reports. One source revealed that Hezbollah is moving quickly with its plans, while Iran seems to be taking more time to decide on its course of action. Despite this, Iran has made some preparations, but not all that the U.S. would expect before a major attack on Israel. Given Lebanon's close proximity to Israel, Hezbollah could potentially act with little to no warning, unlike Iran, which would require more time to launch an attack. It's unclear how closely Iran and Hezbollah are coordinating at this time, and some officials believe the two may not be fully aligned on their strategies. These potential attacks are likely in response to Israel's recent killing of Fuad Shukar, Hezbollah's top military commander, in Lebanon. Following this, Israel is also believed to have assassinated Hamas political leader in Tehran, though Israel has not confirmed or denied involvement. In the wake of these events, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, convened an emergency meeting in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where foreign ministers condemned Israel's actions and reaffirmed their support for the Palestinian cause. The OIC particularly condemned the assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran, calling it a violation of international law and a threat to regional stability. This week, U.S. President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken have been actively engaging with leaders in the Middle East, including Jordan, Qatar, and Egypt, to push for de-escalation in the region. Cyprus ready to assist in large-scale evacuations from the Middle East Cyprus has announced that it is prepared to help evacuate foreign civilians from Lebanon if the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah escalates. According to government spokesman Yanis Antoniou, the Cypriot government is ready to assist if necessary. Several European Union embassies have already reached out to Cyprus to discuss potential evacuation plans. Cyprus, being the closest EU member state to the Middle East, has often served as a hub for aid and evacuations during regional crises. With a flight time of just 35 minutes from Lebanon, Cyprus is ideally positioned to assist. In addition to flights, Ferries could be used to transport people to Cypriot ports like Limassol or Larnaca, a method that has been employed in recent months to bring people to safety. The evacuation plan, known as Operation Hestia, outlines how airplanes from EU states and other countries would pick up their citizens and families from Lebanon or Israel and bring them to Cyprus. The plan also details temporary housing arrangements for evacuees until they can be flown to their home countries. Concerns about a potential major war in the region have grown following the recent targeted killings of key figures in Hamas and Hezbollah, which have led to threats of retaliation against Israel. Israeli military orders another mass evacuation in southern Gaza. The Israeli military has issued another mass evacuation order for large areas around Khan Yunus, the second largest city in Gaza. This comes as Israeli forces prepare to operate in the region in response to ongoing Palestinian rocket fire. Earlier this year, Khan Yunus experienced significant destruction due to air and ground operations. Since the beginning of the 10-month-old conflict, Israeli forces have repeatedly returned to heavily damaged areas of Gaza to engage in further battles against Hamas and other militant groups. Gaza is currently facing a severe humanitarian crisis. Israeli restrictions on aid, combined with the ongoing fighting, have made it difficult to access essential medical supplies, food, and other necessities. The health ministry reports that the death toll in Gaza is nearing 40,000. Tensions in the region have escalated since the assassination of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh on July 31 in Iran, presumably by an Israeli strike. Retaliation is expected and French President Emmanuel Macron has urged Iranian President Massoud Pazeshkian to prevent further military escalation, warning that it could have long-lasting effects on regional stability. Global leaders are pushing for a ceasefire in Gaza. U.S. President Joe Biden discussed hopes for de-escalation in the Middle East with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi earlier this week. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu informed his cabinet that Israel is already engaged in a multi-front war with Iran and its allies. Netanyahu expresses regret over October 7 attack.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed his regret over the deadly October 7 attack by Hamas, stating in an interview with Time magazine that he was sorry it occurred. While he did not explicitly take responsibility, Netanyahu acknowledged the tragedy, saying, I am sorry, deeply, that something like this happened. He also reflected on whether more could have been done to prevent the attack. Netanyahu, Israel's longest-serving prime minister, has built his reputation on being a strong defender of Israel's security. Following the attack, he initially blamed the intelligence services for failing to foresee the Hamas operation but later deleted and apologized for that statement after facing criticism for deflecting blame. When asked by time what advice he would give to a political rival who oversaw such a security failure, Netanyahu responded that it depended on whether the leader could lead Israel to victory and ensure peace and security in the post-war situation. The October 7 attack was the deadliest in Israel's history, claiming 1,198 lives, mostly civilians, according to Israeli official figures. Palestinian militants also captured 251 hostages, with 111 still held in Gaza, including 39 whom the Israeli military believes are deceased. In response, Israel's military campaign in Gaza has resulted in at least 39,677 deaths, according to the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza. Israel revokes accreditation of Norwegian diplomats to Palestinian areas. Israel has revoked the accreditation of eight Norwegian diplomats working as representatives to the Palestinian Authority, a move that has sparked significant diplomatic tension. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz announced the decision citing Norway's anti-Israeli conduct, including its recognition of a Palestinian state, as the reason for the revocation. Katz stated that Norway's one-sided policy on the Palestinian issue led to this action. Norwegian Foreign Minister Espen Barth Eide responded by calling the move an extreme act, and noted that it would hinder Norway's ability to assist the Palestinian population. He also warned that the decision would have consequences for Norway's relationship with the government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The Palestinian Authority condemned Israel's decision, labeling it a violation and breach of international laws. Hussein al-Sheikh, the General Secretary of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, warned of the decision's dangerous implications and significant repercussions. Norway has historically played a key role in mediating peace between Israel and the Palestinians, notably through its involvement in the Oslo Accords. Recently, along with Spain and Ireland, Norway officially recognized a Palestinian state in May, hoping to advance efforts toward a ceasefire in the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. Israel, however, criticized this recognition, arguing that it emboldened Hamas the group responsible for the deadly October 7 attack that led to the current conflict in Gaza. U.S. nears ceasefire agreement amid rising Middle East tensions. The Biden administration has announced that it is closer than ever to securing a ceasefire in the ongoing conflict between Iran-backed Hamas and Israel, which has lasted over 300 days. The U.S. has been working on a three-phase ceasefire deal, first outlined by President Joe Biden in May. However, Recent assassinations of key Iran proxy leaders have escalated tensions, with fears that these events could derail the peace efforts. White House officials, including National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby, expressed confidence in the ongoing negotiations, which involve Hamas, Israel, the United States, Egypt, and Qatar. Kirby stated, We are as close as we think we have ever been, but noted that some details still need to be finalized before the deal is signed. The war in Gaza began on October 7 when Hamas launched a surprise attack on Israel, killing 1,200 Israelis and taking 251 hostages, 115 of whom are still held in Gaza. Israel responded with intense military action, resulting in nearly 40,000 Palestinian deaths and around 92,000 injuries, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. The proposed ceasefire deal includes an initial six-week pause to facilitate the release of some hostages in exchange for Palestinian prisoners held by Israel. The second phase would focus on securing a permanent end to hostilities, while the third phase involves the release of all deceased hostages and initiating a major reconstruction plan for Gaza. Secretary of State Antony Blinken described the negotiations as being in their final stage, emphasizing the importance of avoiding actions that could disrupt the peace process. However, 
Potential retaliatory attacks on Israel for recent assassinations remain a significant concern. Iran has confirmed that it would pursue a retaliatory strike against Israel, even if a ceasefire with Hamas is secured, aiming to punish Israel for the assassinations and to prevent future attacks. Argentine President Miley criticizes progressive hypocrisy amid domestic violence allegations against predecessor. Argentine President Javier Miley has condemned what he calls progressive hypocrisy after his predecessor, Alberto Fernandez, was accused of domestic violence by his ex-girlfriend, Fabiola Yanez. The accusations come after Yanez, 43, filed a complaint on Tuesday alleging that Fernandez physically abused her during their relationship, which ended after he left office in 2023. In a post on the ex-social network, Miley criticized the leftist policies of his predecessor, claiming they failed to address the real issues of gender violence. Since taking office in December, Miley has abolished the National Women's Affairs Ministry, the Anti-Discrimination Agency, and banned gender-inclusive language in the military, actions that have drawn accusations of sexism and misogyny against his administration. Miley responded to these criticisms by arguing that the solution to violence against women is not through creating ministries or hiring more public employees but by being tough on those who commit crimes. The domestic violence allegations against Fernandez surfaced during a separate fraud investigation when text messages and photographic evidence detailing the alleged abuse were found on the phone of Fernandez's private secretary, Maria Contero. Initially, Yanez decided not to press charges but later changed her mind and filed a criminal complaint against Fernandez. As the investigation continues, Fernandez has been barred from leaving the country. He has denied the allegations, stating that the truth of the facts is different and that the alleged incidents never happened. Fernandez also emphasized that he will provide evidence to support his innocence and protect the integrity of his children and Yanez. The case has sparked widespread attention and debate in Argentina, with Maile using the situation to criticize the effectiveness of the previous administration's gender policies. Russia declares state of emergency in Kursk region amid Ukrainian incursion. Russia has declared a state of emergency in its western Kursk region due to an ongoing incursion by Ukrainian forces. The incursion, which began on Tuesday night, has resulted in the deaths of five civilians and injuries to 30 others, including six children. Regional Governor Alexei Smirnov announced the state of emergency on Wednesday night, citing the need to address the consequences of the cross-border raid launched by Ukraine. Smirnov also ordered the evacuation of thousands of residents from the border area and announced that humanitarian aid, including supplies like washing machines and refrigerators, is being sent to temporary accommodation centers set up for those displaced by the fighting. Russia claims that around 1,000 Ukrainian troops, supported by tanks and armored vehicles, crossed into the country near the town of Sudza. Fighting has been reported in border villages, and air raid warnings have been issued. Despite these developments, Russian President Vladimir Putin described the incursion as a large-scale provocation and claimed that Russian forces have thwarted Ukraine's attempt to breach the state border. The Russian military, led by General Valery Gerasimov, reported significant Ukrainian casualties and losses of military equipment. However, the Institute for the Study of War suggests that Ukrainian forces have made confirmed advances of several miles into Russia's Kursk region, penetrating at least two Russian defensive lines. Ukrainian officials have not officially commented on the incursion, but Ukrainian MP Oleksiy Honcharenko claimed that Ukrainian forces had captured a natural gas hub in Sudza a key facility exporting Russian gas to the European Union. He also emphasized that Ukraine is taking the initiative in the conflict and urged for continued support from international allies, particularly the United States. The White House has confirmed that it is in contact with Kyiv to understand Ukraine's objectives but has not been informed in advance of the incursion. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre declined to speculate on whether U.S. supplied arms were used in the operation reiterating that U.S. policy remains focused on supporting Ukraine's defense against Russian aggression. North Korean defector crosses neutral waters to South Korea. A North Korean defector has successfully crossed neutral waters separating North and South Korea, arriving in the South early Thursday morning. The individual was apprehended by South Korea's military and is currently being investigated by relevant authorities. 
According to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, the defector is believed to have crossed the Han River estuary, a neutral zone located west of the inter-Korean border, and reached South Korea's Gyodong Island on foot during low tide. The defector reportedly expressed a desire to seek asylum in South Korea. As of now, there have been no unusual movements from the North Korean military in response to the incident. This defection is notable as it involves crossing by sea, which is less common compared to the majority of North Korean defectors who typically escape via land routes through China. Historically, over 34,000 North Koreans have defected to South Korea to flee harsh economic conditions and the oppressive regime in the North. However, the number of defectors has significantly decreased since North Korea tightened its borders due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite this, 105 defectors managed to reach South Korea in the first half of this year, showing a slight increase compared to the same period last year. Vietnamese Navy frigate visits China amid escalating tensions in the South China Sea. A Vietnamese Navy frigate, the guided missile ship 015 Tran Hung Dao, arrived in southern China on Wednesday for a five-day visit, signaling efforts to enhance military relations between Vietnam and China despite ongoing tensions in the South China Sea. The visit takes place in Zhangjiang, Guangdong Province, home to the headquarters of China's Southern Theater Command Navy, which oversees operations in the disputed South China Sea. During the visit, both countries plan to engage in various activities, including ship tours, cultural exchanges, joint exercises, and receptions, with the aim of improving mutual understanding and trust between their navies. This visit comes at a time of heightened military activities in the South China Sea. The Philippines, along with the United States, Canada, and Australia, began their first ever joint naval and air exercises, while China conducted joint sea and air patrols around the contested Scarborough Shoal. Additionally, there have been reports of Chinese drones flying close to Vietnam's coastline, increasing regional tensions. Despite their long-standing disputes over territory in the South China Sea, Vietnam and China have made efforts to improve communication and coordination. Recently, both nations conducted joint patrols in the Gulf of Tonkin, focusing on search and rescue operations and signal light drills. Vietnam, while maintaining its critical stance on China's expansive claims in the South China Sea, practices bamboo diplomacy, carefully balancing its relations with China and the United States. This approach allows Vietnam to build strong defense ties with the U.S. and its allies, such as Japan which recently announced the provision of defense equipment to Vietnam as part of an ongoing agreement. Prosecutors allege Hunter Biden agreed to lobby U.S. on behalf of Romanian businessman. Federal prosecutors have made new allegations against Hunter Biden, claiming he agreed to lobby U.S. officials on behalf of a Romanian businessman facing legal troubles in Romania. This latest development is part of the ongoing tax evasion case being pursued by special counsel David Weiss, with a trial scheduled to start in September. According to the filing, Hunter Biden allegedly agreed to influence U.S. policy by reaching out to U.S. agencies and officials regarding the Romanian businessman, identified only by the initials GP prosecutors stated that Biden did contact U.S. government officials, including those at the State Department, but did not provide specific details about these communications. One of Biden's business partners is expected to testify that they were concerned about the potential political fallout of the lobbying work and, as a result, disguised it as real estate management. However, prosecutors clarified that this witness has not alleged that Biden engaged in improper political influence. Despite years of investigation, Hunter Biden has not been charged with any foreign lobbying violations. The prosecutors have indicated that they do not plan to introduce evidence or argue that Biden violated the Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA, or that he was funneling money to his father, President Joe Biden. House Republicans have previously scrutinized payments Hunter Biden received from Romanian business associates, but these claims have not been substantiated in court. Hunter Biden has pleaded not guilty to the tax charges and has argued that the investigation is politically motivated. The trial is set to begin on September 5 in Los Angeles, and Biden is also scheduled for sentencing in November for a separate case involving gun felonies. Trump schedules news conference amid poll surge for Harris. Donald Trump has called a sudden news conference at his Florida resort, set for Thursday, 
following mounting concerns within his presidential campaign and a notable rise in poll numbers for his rival, Kamala Harris. Trump's announcement came via his Truth Social platform, describing it as a general news conference. This move coincides with Harris' campaign gaining momentum. With President Joe Biden out of the race, Harris and her new running mate, Tim Walls, have attracted large, enthusiastic crowds and significantly closed the gap in the polls. Reports suggest that Trump is frustrated with his campaign's performance and media coverage, particularly in light of Harris' recent surge. Additionally, there is growing dissatisfaction with Trump's young Republican running mate, J.D. Vance, who has faced criticism for his public speaking and voter appeal.